great. Thank you, worship team, for putting that together. And now we'll have Pastor Lee deliver um, God's word this morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brian first to offer a prayer for offering and also offer our hearts to uh, receive God's word today. So I'm going to ask uh, Brother Brian Liu to pray for us. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, let's pray for the offering. Father God, Lord, I uh, want to thank you for just giving us this beautiful day. Um, thank you for just giving us the ability to come together and just worship you. And uh, Father Lord, uh, for those who are financially able to do so, we thank you and we uh, ask that you just continue to bless those offering that we have. And we also ask for those who are unable, that they would just offer whatever it is that they have, as you taught us in the Bible, that there are those who gave up all that she had, even like one cup of coin or whatever it is, just because they love, they love you. And so, Lord, we ask for the abundance of blessings that you have for us. We ask that you just bless the church and we ask that those offerings, <clears throat> those blessings would just be multiplied to further your kingdom. And so Lord, we thank you for just giving us the opportunity to come together despite these circumstances and whatever and however and whenever we can come together uh, physically as a church body, that we would just embrace one another, whether we're physically distant, socially distant, embracing one another, or just, you know, like air high five, whatever it is to show that, you know, hey, you know, we're, we, we love you, you know, we're, we're, one, we're, t we're together, one body, uh, just whenever, whatever, and however, uh, it's going to be an awesome time. And so, Lord, um, you know, we thank you for the blessings that we have, and we thank you for the blessings that, you know, we will receive from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Okay, thank you, Brian. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see uh, you guys again. Um, we thank God for last week. Uh, we had a guest speaker, Pastor Chris Williams, to really challenge us about how to... Uh, come together uh, in understanding the perspective of God's lens uh, through the world. And we had conversation, I had conversation with him afterwards still. And uh, good news is that uh, we invited him to speak on July 28th, August 28th for our youth group um, gathering. Uh, so that will be something that we look forward to. But uh, just to continue with what Pastor Chris talked about in today's uh, circumstance uh, there are some stuff that sometimes we have high high heated debates and, and conversations and opinions um, and sometimes you know, we, it's good to have different opinions in in our life to debate and to talk about differences and 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 your uh, your leaning on what you think is right uh, even common thing like uh, you, if you have if you're a sports fan you know uh, uh, if you play uh, like football, New England Patriots is uh, is like a rival against New York or whoever's team, and then we we, we could have like strong argument about you know who's the best team uh, you think it is. So it's good. Uh, sometimes we see that, but some, when you, you know sometimes when you go to a, like a Yankees and Boston Red Sox game, uh, it gets nasty when you see people throwing beers and punching people uh, opposite the fans, right? And that becomes trouble. Uh, I think same same thing in Christian circles. Uh, we could have friendly friendly dialogue and opinions, but then it gets nasty. It gets uh, you throw punches with words. You you start to maybe have a bad attitude towards the person you disagree with. And this is a it is, it is an issue. Look at look at uh, any relationship, marriage also proves that 
there's different opinions. And when you don't really accept the other person's opinion, you get into a bad fight. And so this is, a, again, a hot matter that God wants us to address with our own relationship. Uh, and so we're going to look at, continue our study in Corinthians. Uh, we, we're up to chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1 passage, verses 26 to 31. So you have your Bible. Uh, please turn to your, uh, your Bible, uh, Bible app. And we will look at this, how Paul continue to address the common theme, division in the church. The church is divided and, and, and uh, it's not good if a church is divided with issues. And so how does Paul continue to address the church division and our, our own hearts? How are we divided? We have a divided heart uh, with people. So that's something that God will hopefully show us what, what he says. Um, so let's read it. Uh, Verses 26 to 31 uh, in First Corinthians chapter 1. It says this, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and despised the things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. In verse 31, this is the title of the message today. Uh, it says, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay, that's the title. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so, uh, again, division of the church. Christians are divided. Shocking. Right? How, can, how can there be division in the body of Christ? Because all churches, remember, are imperfect. Uh, uh, Christians, are, believers are still imperfect. Uh, you just go on the social media. For example, you see two sides uh, of Christians. One side, they call themselves maybe Republican Christians. The other side, Democrat Christians. Then you have like other labels. But the two strong opinions of uh, wh who is the right uh, group to belong to as Christians. And, and they disagree, right? Um, uh, even the union of marriage, like I said before, husband and wife disagree. And it's very interesting that you, you attend any marriage uh, ceremony, the common theme and, and, and vows they, they have is about unity, uh, oneness, being one flesh, right? Uh, they quote the Genesis Bible, bone of my f uh, bone, flesh of my flesh, uh, become one. And, but yet you see clashes with husband and wife. By the way, Joanne and I just celebrated uh, 22nd anniversary this Friday. We went to the Brooklyn, we went to Manhattan, Times Square to celebrate our 22nd uh, anniversary. But then we also celebrate Carrie's uh, eighth grade uh, celebration. But just to remember, marriage demonstrate the fact that we are not perfect. Um, we still sin. We, we have disagreements, different opinions uh, all the time. Uh, and sometimes it's unhealthy, right? Uh, and then you see divorce comes. That's the tragic thing about divided heart. And the same thing with divided church. Uh, is a, is a sad thing when you have a divided heart. Uh, we 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 kind of split into uh, churches. So, like Pastor Chris talked to us yesterday uh, last week, he reminds us that the world is messy. That the world is divided. And, and the prime example is what happened on May 25th after the death of George Floyd. Raises, raises or becomes a hot topic, the hottest topic. And the world is divided with pro or against Black Lives Matters or pro or, or against uh, defunding, demantling the police department. You have both sides arguing, heated arguments. 
And the worst and saddest part is that the church is divided in these matters, right? And, and within, within the Christian circles, we see heated arguments of who's right, who's wrong. Uh, uh, and, and I don't know about you, do you feel the tension that, that you have to join one side, right? You, you get that feeling that if you, if, and you hope you are joining the right, right side because the other side will see you as an enemy if you are not on their side. Right, I think it makes sense. If we if we all are seeking the truth, we we want to be on the right side, and and we want to voice out what uh what is you know my right is is right, uh and your side is wrong, and so for and maybe for those who don't care even or can't even decide what side they want they just they should lean on. You you are not, you also are accused. You, you can't make a you make a you can't make a decision about what's what's going on. You you've been silenced. If you've even been silenced, you're accused of your your problem. You're insensitive, and maybe you even may be called a label. You're you're just an anarchist or a hater of everything in life. But but so the question is: Is there a equilibrium? Is there a balance um, uh, for Christians? If you are a Christian Republican, if you are a Christian Democrat, who disagree on on politics, and even church ministry, is there a balance to it? Right? Uh, can can Christians uh, differ in theology or even some doctrinal matters? Right. For example, we see predestination, free will. Uh, we 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 uh, we have we hear people uh, who argue once you're saved. You are always saved, and the, but the other people will argue. Uh, well, if you're a Christian, you could lose your salvation, and then there are tedious arguments, like should we serve lunch or not? Should we have dark meat or white meat? Even in Christian, we fight about all those things. Um, let's can you handle Margaret. She said she can't sign in. Um, she texted me. Sorry. Well, is is there uh, a balance to what's going on? Uh, well, before we look at our passage, Paul's response to the Old Testament, uh, this, the Old Testament also uh, gave us an answer about how to think about what's going on, who's right, who's wrong, which side are you belong to, uh, and so forth. And there's a, there's a uh, passage in, in Joshua, I want to re uh, just give you a capture of what's going on. You could turn to it, it's chapter 5, uh, it's a, I think it's a familiar passage. Uh, dealing with what's uh, who's right, who's wrong, and when, and when we think you are on the right side, you you we justify that God must be on my side because I'm fighting for His truth, right? That, and that's the context. And it's in in Joshua chapter five, verses thirteen to fifteen. Uh, and the story, and this story is an interesting story uh, incident because God commissioned Joshua to take over Moses. Uh, to bring the Israelites to the promised land. So now, and just so in chapter one, and, and God said, "Be bold and courageous. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the assignment to take these stubborn Israelites to the promised land." And so Joshua tried, tried, and, and uh, he experienced the 40 years in the wilderness, and all the people mostly died. The the, the old e uh, people who were living in Egypt die and new birth. During the wilderness, the new men grew up, and they become the army. But the one of the problems they have is that they're not circumcised. So they have to. So uh, God said to, to to Joshua, circumcise these men before they go to battle, and they did. And that's what chapter four happens. Uh, all these men were were that weak because you know if you you're a man, you know what circumcised means, right? Uh, parents could explain to your kids what circumcision means. Uh, you know, you're not, once you get circumcised, you're not going to go out and play and jump and leap, right? You have to heal, rest, uh, and, and, you know, no, no relationship with, with women for a while. And so, uh, but that's what's going on. And then uh, right before that, they are ready to go battle to Jericho. And you, you, you're going to see the Jericho war marching, marching, marching around the Jericho war and the war falls out. But before that incident, uh, in verse 13, Joshua saw something magnificent he saw the angel of the lord the commander of the army is called 
and most people believe this is Jesus Christ incarnate uh, uh, in Old Testament in, in, the, in the form of this uh, commander of the angel com uh, commander is God himself, Jesus himself speaking. And so here, listen to what it says. Now when Joshua was in, near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Hey, are you for us or for our enemies? Now, very interesting implication here. Uh, Joshua is saying, if you're not on my side, you are automatically, automatically my enemy. But right, think about that. We, think, we, we do that all the time. Hey, you must be on my side because if you're not agreeing with me, then you must be my enemy. Right? That's the attitude we have. And then that's what Joshua think as well. But it's a very shocking response. What, what did he say in verse 14, right? Uh, in Joshua 5, it says, neither. Uh, no, I'm not in either of your side. Wow. Think about that. Jesus says, I'm not in either of your side. But what did he say? But, I, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reference and ask him, this is a very important part of the question, uh, verse 14. What message does my Lord have for his servant? We should, we should pray about that ourselves when we come to the Lord. When we, when we have heated arguments, when we, when we, we, don't, when we dis don't disagree, when, when a heart feels dis divided, a church feels divided. Maybe we should say, ask God, uh, what message does my Lord have for me, for your servant? And this is a good start. When, when you are torn and when, when what is right, what is wrong, whose sides do you lean on? Like this, like for example, like this whole paradox we, we are dealing with, the black, white matter, or all life matter, right? Both sides have validity of truth. There, there's, and there's great tension to support both sides to a certain degree, right? It's good, but it's good to pause and pray and ask, Lord, what do you really want to say to me? Like Joshua finally realized. And, and this is a challenge for Christian leaders and pastors uh, must also ask this question or this prayer. And I, know, I know pastors who are very clear of which side they lean on. But I know some pastors really struggle with, with guilt and, and shame. Uh, they don't know what to do. And there are some Christians and pastors are torn between, the, the, so, they, so they should support Black Lives Matter, or the, so they say all life matter, right? I'm sure you guys have your, your arguments uh, with your group of people. So it's, but, but it's not that simple, right? You know, I, you know for example, have you have, have, a, have this uh, advertisement, uh, $500 reward credit, credit, if you, uh, it's for you if you sign up for this credit card. You ever done that? But the catch is, sounds great. Wow, I get $500 cash or reward credit uh, if I sign up for this credit card. But the, the stipulate, uh, 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 the, the, the reason you have to sign up, but you have to meet this certain requirement. You have to spend at least $3,000 to get the $500. Now, if, you're, if, I mean, if you know that you are maybe go on a big vacation and, and, and you know you, there are big spending coming up, it makes sense to uh, sign up for the card, spend at least $3,000, but then they will credit you back $500. So you, you, you basically only spend $2,500. So that, that makes reasonable sense if you are about to spend money on travels and, and buy, buy large items, right? But the, the point is that five hundred dollars sounds like attractive, but you have to know what is entail, what they require. But but on the negative side, right? When you, if you join a group or when you join a a cause, there's some something you have to know. What is the backdrop? What is what is something you have to join uh, as a whole? If it's really bad, then maybe you shouldn't maybe join, right? So that's a challenge, right? For 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 what we're dealing with, what was, what's, and I'll give you an example of what's 
Black Lives Matter organization. I, I want to challenge you to go into their 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 uh, uh, reasons, what they stand for, and you'll be really shocking, surprised. Some of them are very against what the Bible talks about. So here's the struggle: Do you support uh, people who are going through racism? Of course, but will you support enough to back up the whole organization, what they really stand for, which really is against the scripture and God's truth. So that's a challenge for us to really debate about and, and think about. But even that is a tension. Um, I'll give you a good example. Another example, my good friend, uh, Pastor Eddie Cole, who was a former senior pastor at Salem Church in, in uh, Staten Island. Uh, he shared this on his Facebook. And I want to re uh, give you uh, his what he shared. He said this: one of the best, one of my best friends I have I, I have had in my life recently told me that his girlfriend recently came home and started to hang up a cross on the wall. His re his response was to tell her, "Get that darn thing out of here." Now I I, I said the word nicely. There was a more colorful word and Pastor Eddie said ah oh, the most precious symbol of love in my life remains the symbol of hate for him he said I have much to learn but here's where, what I know I love my friend his perspective and it's real and personal yet I still love the symbol of the cross it's equally real and personal but in a whole different way to me. It reminds me of, it reminds my friend of hate, but it reminds me of love, the cross. And he says, I hate that we, I hate that we live in a day in a country where most people say they hate racism, but they don't have the common sense or the decency to actually listen to people who share their hatred for racism but have a different perspective of what it looks like, feels like, and what we might be able to do to combat it. God, help us to be willing to be unselfish and uncomfortable for a little while so that we can understand and help one another. If we, if we do, perhaps we'll see. I mean, I, I think that's a really great example of how a person struggles with wanting to understand what's going on, but yet the very thing that they hold there, the cross, so mean, so it has so deep meaning uh, of love for him, but yet he still wants to know what his friend feel like, how he feels the cross, his hate, because of his life, he grew up knowing that this person's, he's, he's, he says, he, he, he has, he, the person said, wonder why that is because he says because as a young boy he he saw a large blazing cross in the lawn where he lived, so the message was made very clear to him that there there were there were people who hated him for no other reason than the color of his skin. Right, so that's the tension, that's the struggle uh, we we come to. So what would you do? Let me ask you if you were the friend, uh, uh, you have a friend like that. How would you respond to your, to your friend who see the cross as hate, but you see it as, as love? You know, I'm, I'm wearing a cross, you see? My mom gave me this cross. I love this cross, right, for, for my mom, but I love it because it represents something deeper. I know the cross, well, actually, we just talked about the cross of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ of the cross. Paul said, hang on to the cross of the gospel, right? But what, what should I do if I have a friend like Pastor Eddie who see the cross as hate? Uh, maybe if I see him, I, I hide it, you know, uh, uh, maybe make sure if he comes to my house, take down the cross. A friend who hates the cross is, uh, we need to hide every cross. Or should we stand up? Uh, and say, you know, this, this is what we mean, but maybe, hey, well, it's his problem. He, he has to deal with the hate in him. It's not that simple, right? And, but I come back to what the Bible says. Look at how Joshua and we think, again, 
if someone is not on your side, then we judge them. You're, you're my enemy. And that's what how Josh responds to the commander of the Lord uh, at first. And we see this all the time. Two siblings are arguing, and they, they and they want their father and mother to be a. Hey, be on my side because I'm right and he's wrong or she's wrong. Right? At school, you ever experienced that? Your BFF didn't take your side. You want your BFF to be on your side when you when for another person you disagree with. And if your BFF is silent, then you then you treat your BFF as an enemy because you were disappointed. And then your relationship went sour from then on. And in Christian circles, we too, we see two people strongly disagree. We start to throw, this is another crazy thing. We throw, we throw Bible verses back and forth about our opinions. And the crazy thing is that we, we quote the same Bible verse to argue our, our, our disagreements. And both sides can be right. So what is the real solution what, when we are divided, when we disagree with one another uh, for the church? For the marriage, for Christian debating on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, or whatever social media we find ourselves in a hot debate. You know, I, I got in trouble a few times uh, when I when I voiced my opinion, and I got my wife or people close to me say, "Hey, cool down, cool down, don't don't write anymore." Uh, and they they understand. I guess uh, what I'm coming from, but then maybe it's not a good time to write anything. Uh, so I'm learning, I'm learning myself. Uh, when I feel convicted about what should be uh, right, but maybe I need to pause like what, what Joshua was told to from the Lord, from, from Jesus. And this is what Jesus says, right? Uh, to Joshua, the commander of the Lord, uh, he said, I am the, the commander of the Lord's army, rep uh, he replied. He says to him, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. Verse 15, as I believe. And, and Joshua did so, right? So what, what's, what's happening? Joshua humbled himself and worshiped God. He came to God with fear and reverence because he knew himself was a sinful man. So when we come to a point of division, uh, perhaps we need to take off our sinful nature and come to the throne of grace, allow the cross of the gospel to examine our own hearts. And per perhaps winning, maybe winning the right to be right is not the, the aim anymore in the point here. But just recognize that God is not on either side of the argument, right? He, we don't want to pull God to say, take my side, God, because you know I'm trying to fight for you. But at this point, maybe God say, I'm not even on your side anymore. Right? I want you to just to humble yourself. Come to take up your sandal. Right? And, and again, right? And it, it's really tough because here is a, I mentioned, you, if you watch a football game, like a Super Bowl, or any game, you know something very interesting. You see a team of group of players standing or kneeling in a circle. What are they doing? Praying, right? They, but the crazy thing is the other team, the opponent team, also same, similar. You see another group of people praying too. What, what are they praying? Or oh, maybe, maybe God protect them, give them honor, give them a good game. But they both are probably pray, praying that God, we want to win the game. The aim is to win the game, but who, whose side is God's, who, who is God's listening to the prayer to win the game? Does God care who wins the game? It's crazy. I, I see two groups of uh, opponent teams praying to God for their motive, but ultimately they want to win the game. I don't think, I don't think God cares for about football. I don't think God cares about who wins. Who, whose prayer is he more delighting in that he has favor to win, to give favor to the game? That's, that's just really crazy to me to think about how people pray and they think, oh, God's on my side. And we do that. We do that all the time. 
Uh, let's go back to the divided church in Corinthian. What's going on in the Corinthian church? Members were taking sides. One side think they are right. The other side think they are right. One side, one side was boasting, hey, we have Paul on our side. Another side said, well, we have Apollo on our side. And, and then another side said, uh, a leader said, we have this leader, that leader on our side. And then one, one side said, the, did they have the audacity say, well, we have Jesus on my side. Right? That was the crazy thing that's going on in Corinthian church. Have you ever heard about this statement? Well, Jesus, the Jesus I know will support this and that. Right? Well, the Jesus I read in the Bible believe in this. Right? And, and that's what's going on. Crazy. And then, um, and then Paul says in verses 26 to 28, uh, one of the problems they had, they were boasting and, and taking great pride in their, in their wisdom, understanding with their gifts and their abilities. That's what basically what uh, Paul was saying uh, in, in addressing in verses 26, 28. Uh, right? And he and basically, he was he he was telling people like we people say that in our in in our lifetime we say we, in, in, we might not say it out loud but we we think it in our thought we will say something like well do you know where I went to school do you know my profession and my job my title do you know do you know how many experience I have in in life so it's an attitude of posting of how great they, they were to argue they were right and they, they are wrong. And so it, it comes, Paul says, right now, right or wrong, we're not even the, the issue anymore. Paul was addressing their attitude. And what was the attitude? It was their pride. Even though you're right, but your pride made it wrong. Think about, right? Really think about it. Even though you're right, but if you're if but if you have the attitude of pride, it makes you wrong. That's a hot matter. So when pride kicks in the conversation and debates, you don't treat the other person who you disagree with in the right manner anymore. Why? Right? Because Christians, we should always have the fruit of the spirit in our words, in our actions. Uh, uh, toward people, especially when, when we disagree with them, especially when you think you are right in your argument about an issue. And here's a, here's a sober reflection. The world and society may esteem you. They may praise you because of your intellect, education, background, your title, your career. I mean, the world will praise you. Wow, how great you are. But Paul says here, well, uh, church, God doesn't esteem you. Even the world esteem you, but you are not esteemed by God. Are you woke? You see that? But, uh, James 4 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Right? This fact this, this truth bothers the prideful people. They never want to hear they need to be humble. And this is the very thing that keeps so many uh, from, from becoming acceptable to God. Pride, self-sufficiency, uh, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, whatever uh, may choose to call it. Right? You know, uh, before I was, before I, I was blessed to marry Joanne, like I said, we celebrate 22 years of marriage. Now, I had an unfortunate relationship dating a Christian girl from Taiwan. I want to share a little bit. Uh, her, her parents had strong traditions and values, uh, Taiwan's values. Uh, my then girlfriend, you know, she graduated from an Ivy League university. You might have heard of, you might have heard of it, UPenn. Uh, somewhere. She was the vice president of a top four, 500 corporation. And as we were dating for several months, she uh, called me one day at work 
And basically, she wanted to break up with me. Um, she said, she said, my parents sacrificed a lot to have me study at a great university. Uh, and, and they expect me to date someone with same caliber, same background. I said, whoa. And then she asked me, she asked me, well, how much money do I make in my investment banking job? Now, that's a good sign, guys. If any woman asks you how much money you make, forget it, right? Well, I was dumbfounded. I, I, was, I was like, wow, this conversation didn't happen? I was, so I was like, okay, if you want to stop dating, that's fine. So we hung up. But a few days later, she called me back crying, apologizing. Maybe some of her Christian friends like say, what's wrong with you? Why do you say that? Uh, to, uh, even her sister, I think we must uh, reprimand her to even think about that. And that, and that. So I gave her a second chance. But deep down, I knew this person was not the godly wife I was searching for. She was not humble. It was bye bye, buddy. Right? Uh, she was gone. So, but the lesson learned here, and the truth is, Galatians, Galatians 6 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, if you want God to take a side, Paul said, God chooses the side who is humble. And I gather that is what. The verses 27, 28 is saying here, right? Uh, let's let's look at again uh, what 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 is saying here in verse 27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Verse 29. So that no one may boast before Him, right? Yeah, just because you might be more seasoned as a Christian, you are not always right. Just because you read the whole Bible or went to a seminary, it doesn't mean your opinions weigh more clouds, right? This is one of the problems Paul is addressing to this imperfect church. But this, but in this passage, there's a deeper issue. Uh, is that is that some have that uh, view. Uh, that only the high and elite kind of people are worthy to receive salvation. That's what really is another problem here. The, but the lowly, the, the uneducated, the, the low social status, they are not worthy of salvation. And that's why, remember when Peter and other disciples, uh, at first they were shocked when, when, uh, when, when Jesus said, I'm offering salvation for the Gentiles too. And they thought that it was only for the Jews only. And they had a trouble accepting that at first. Right? And this is what's going on in the church. They, they, they think, well, only, only the good people, the, the better people receive salvation. Not everyone deserves salvation. That's, and that's the danger here we see. Uh, when we look at our neighbor, when we look at our community, when we look at a color of a skin, and devalue them and say, well, you're not worthy to come to this church or, or you're not worthy to uh, be in our circle. We are, we are again, having a prideful heart, a, 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 a biased heart. Uh, and God says, this, uh, that's a divided heart for the church. But let's, let's say, let's say, go back to this, uh, Example of both sides are right in their belief and conviction. Right? Let's say both really feel they are right. For example, again, we we'll go back to Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Christians are greatly divided in this uh, situation. So, what is the conclusion if both sides think they are right and and you would not budge on your position? Well, according to John chapter five, we saw. Jesus doesn't take sides, right? He wants us to take off our sandals and worship him, to humble ourselves, to, to remove our, our, our right and wrong position, and then maybe check our attitude for a minute. And, and it's very, very shameful and dangerous to truly believe that the gospel of salvation 
is more important and deserved to an only certain class or race of people, right? And Paul, and Paul here says in 1 Corinthians 30, 30 and 31, if you want to boast about your position, your rights, just stop. Both sides must, he's challenging both sides of the people just to don't, don't fight for your right anymore. Don't boast about what you think. But if you want to boast, he said, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. Right? Think about that, meditate about that statement. If you really want to fight for, about anything, or you really want, want to be boasting about anything, just boast about Jesus. Right? But verse 29 is saying that God has one purpose for saving only the simple and humble people to, to elimin eliminate man's boasting about the earning of rights to, uh, uh, to receive salvation or to believe what they believe, right? Uh, it, it's, it's revealing to, to us that, that all the evil and, and ugliness in this world our country are facing in the inner city uh, is to remind, remind us we continue to have murders, corruption, we, we have immoral thoughts, cursing, anger, arguments, stealing, uh, uh, you know, anything you want to think about, cheating, lying, deception, negative thoughts, harsh speaking. Uh, do you think it will ever stop? There will be no more corruption, no more murders, no more, no more cursing, no more anger, no more arguments. It will, it will happen. That's what Paul is saying, reminding us what this world looks like, right? I mean, this, uh, we, could, we could name all kinds of uh, lists that we see happen every day. You just, you just go on the social media, you see th these ugliness going on, people behaving certain things. And, you, and we, we say, wow, I can't believe people are like that. But, but yeah, people have sinful nature. They were always going to be like that, right? So... And what Paul is uh, saying here is that no matter our education, wisdom, science, technology, power, heritage, politics, uh, we will never have able to fix these problems. Now, uh, this is a, is this doom? Well, that's the reality of the world, right? This is not eternity this is not heaven yet and so with that uh we cannot we can never able to control sin and evil in the world that's the fact we can never change the selfish hearts of men into hearts of love and sacrifice uh we can't fix racism completely right the reason why i know that because I still struggle with sins, right? I, I still have prejudice. I still have racist heart. Uh, because why? Because uh, uh, you and I struggle with lying, maybe. Bad thoughts, pride. So with that, I know no matter what, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. Deep down, there is still always a bias. There is always a, a, uh, a racist heart until we are sanctified completely, right? That's what, the, that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, to sanctify our hearts. But we're not completely perfect until we are glorified, meaning until we see God, until we, Jesus comes back. Then we are perfect in perfection. But on earth, we still, we still struggle and deal with lust, uh, uh, hate, bad thoughts, uh, and so forth. So racism in all of us is still, however great or low degree we have, we, we, we have it. But thank God, you know, Paul says, but there is something that the world does, can offer help and uh, help for them, but you can be helped because you have Jesus. Boast about Jesus, right? 
now the question comes, what right do we have to boast, right? What do we consider ourselves, uh, why do we consider ourselves wise and mighty and noble? Why do we think we are right and others are wrong? What right do we have? We, we think about how, how we are simple person, how we still be incentivized uh, with how we deal with people in, in our own life. Don't you see, so don't you see, if you, if you want to claim any glory, Paul says, if you want to say any boasting, don't boast about yourself. Don't boast, don't, don't, don't glorify yourself about your right anymore, but boast only solely in Christ. And that means only God can save mankind, Paul says. Only God can correct man's heart of depravity and sin. Even, even if, you, if your argument is right, but if your attitude is looking down on your opponent is wrong, you need to just stop and acknowledge Jesus is the one who can save the world's problem, whatever those problems are. Right? The Bible points us back to Jesus. Apart from Jesus, there is no answer. Right? You, you want to talk about what is wrong with racism? Police brutality, uh, inequality, feminism, genocide of, of human race, of religion. And pick your argument to, to argue about. But at the end of the day, Paul says, the Bible says, stop proving you are right and they are wrong. It will, it will go nowhere. Because God sometimes say, I'm not on either side. And Paul knew Jesus Christ is the answer to a divided church, to a divided to a private hearts, private hearts, because we are not perfect. We are, we are still, we still unrighteous in many ways. We have the nature of sin. We can't approach God uh, on, on, in, in his throne with a prideful heart, with, 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 with our own sins. But Paul says, Boast about Jesus. Uh, uh, if you talk about Jesus, uh, what the meaning of the cross means to you, uh, what what it symbolized, what 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 He did for us, then you will see there is hope for you, because He He's the one who can change our hearts to pursue holiness, to pursue righteousness, and and. Uh, you know, this word in NIV, boast, uh, if you read the NIV uh, translation, it kind of misses the mark uh, in the meaning. The be better translation uh, meaning is to give glory, uh, exalt the, in the Lord, or take pride in the Lord. That's the word uh, means here. And other translations say, give glory. To, uh, you want to uh, glorify yourself? Give glory to God. Uh, right? But now, but the challenge here, Paul is addressing to Christians and church family, right? This is, this is an address exhortation to Christians only, right? If you argue or debate with a non-believer, don't waste your breath because an atheist will never see and accept your argument because in their heart, uh, they are tainted with sin and, and unrepentance. So, so tr to, to stop trying to... Uh, win your cause of argument. But, but, next, but next time we disagree as Christians, as a family of a church family, as a husband and wife, as, as a Christian husband and wife, uh, the Bible reminds us, God is, God is not on either side of, God is not on the husband's side, God is not on the wife's side, right? He doesn't take sides. God wants us both to be humble, the husband and wife, the church, the brothers and sisters to be humble, uh, to take off our sandals because we are all, we are on a holy ground, we are in the presence of God, and he he wanted to tell us instead of try to win the argument, prove your right, like Paul says here, both sides, a hey, both both of your sides give God the glory, right? Boast about the Lord, focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ alone, allowing Jesus and the Holy Spirit to work in, in our hearts, which is being always sanctified with, with our own imperfections. And we will realize it is not about wanting to win anymore the argument. 
or who, who is better or who is right. And when we boast about Jesus, when we give glo glory to Jesus, I think the ultimate thing we learn to respond to the person we disagree with, this is the radical thing Jesus says. We pray and we love our enemy. When we give glory to Jesus, we, we are reminded to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this is the greatest Christian act, to pray and love for your enemy who is against you or even oppress you. And I take it that's what the Bible says here. If anyone wants to boast, boast about Jesus. And God uses the humble Christians to boast and to give glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if, if we depend on people like Billy Graham, Tim Keller, Jim Cimbala, Rick Warren, all these great people you think you, you know who admire, uh, if we depend on them, uh, we're in trouble. The gospel will never be reached to the ends of the earth. What Paul is saying here is that what is so powerful and amazing is that God uses us, you, simple people, humble people like you and I, that we can boast about our Lord Jesus Christ and, and glory in Jesus Christ's name. We, we can uh, be passionate about our Lord Jesus Christ to share the gospel. Don't think that only uh, these great names that you admire to, to reach the ends of your earth. What Paul is challenging us here is, in this passage, God uses you and me, humble people, lowly people, uh, the people that the world think are worthless, but God said you're worth, you're, you're worth it, your value. And that was the, that's what the beauty of the gospel is, right? Uh, that's what, that's what uh, Luke 15 about that, that uh, familiar parable. God, God leaves the 99 sheep and, and go out to that one sheep. And who's that one sheep? It's any soul and any lost soul that, that is, God said, that's valuable. No, no soul uh, is not worth, uh, you know, not worth it to go reach out to, right? Uh, every, any race, any, any, any sinful person deserves to be saved. And that's the beauty of what the gospel means to us. Boast about that, glory, glory in that gospel of Jesus Christ in your life. And when you, when, when you have disagreement, Stop fighting, perhaps, but say, Lord, what, what, what message you want to speak to me about? What do you want me to do? And then God will say, humble yourself. Forget about fighting who you're right and they're wrong, but just humble yourself. Pray for them, love them, and, and then point them back to Jesus. Reflect about what Jesus means to you, and perhaps, God will unite the church, unite the hearts of broken relationships and bring, bring true peace to all of us uh, because we boast in Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, let anyone who boasts, boast in Christ. Amen. Okay. I want to pause a second to uh, just to remind people about uh, announcements. Uh, yes, you know, South, the Cantonese uh, in Chinese uh, service uh, have uh, uh, start phase one. Uh, they went to church to uh, set up uh, the worship team and, and Pastor Ma has been going to church to uh, preach on the pulpit, uh, but then uh, still limited to under 10 people. And for us, uh, we're just gonna wait until uh, we have a, a more, uh, more clearance of, of uh, when the church is fully open and then we'll be ready to uh, sign 
uh, how how people should come in and sit uh, sit down with, with the you know, with the seating that we have. And so we are currently writing writing up the policy and guidelines. So just uh, be patient with that uh, and waiting for for the uh, the states to uh, allow us to truly open up the church. But in the meantime, uh, we will continue to do uh, Zoom uh, worship. Uh, even when we go back to the Zoom uh, to the church uh, building with with allowing uh, a certain amount of people, we still gonna have uh, video zooming for people who still stay home. So it will all be a a process, and 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 even several months of uh, being what we are doing uh, right now. So uh, continue to pray for that. Uh, be patient with that. Um, uh, just a reminder. June 28th, we have the Education Sunday celebration. So we do have a joint uh, worship. We have a guest speaker, uh, and so and we have a translation. So just uh, we and we remind you to take note of that. So the, the timing will be a little bit different, and so we will give you the time on, uh, when it comes. And also that we celebrate graduation of college students uh, uh, and high school students. So uh, pray for those who graduated. Uh, and um, and continue to pray with the small groups uh, during the week and, and fellowship and Bible study and Sunday school classes. We thank God for all the people continue to gather and, and don't give up on meeting. Uh, so keep that up and, and, um, and may God bless you. Uh, so let, let's close with a benediction uh, as we say hi and, and each, each other afterwards. Let's bow our heads. Glory to you, Lord Jesus, that you are who we delight in, you who we boast about, and you who we give glory to, to uh, appoint people to. Lord, in times of div division in a church, in family, in, in, in Christian circles, um, Lord, uh, we pray that we can uh, humble ourselves and come to you and recognize that Lord, uh, that you want us to be, uh, preserve unity in the church, preserve unity in our family homes. We know how Satan wants to divide us with uh, things in life, uh, in, in, in uh, temptations, uh, in attacks. And so well, may you guard our hearts, Lord, in all these things, uh, put on the full armor of God uh, that we can uh, be ready with, with all the spiritual battles that goes on in our lives. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. Amen.